Hello. Thank you all for coming. I think we've got one more on another site. Hey, Barbara. Can you hear yes. me? All right. I can. Um, we do also have some other people on the Life Size website, so they're live streaming from their computers. Just want to let you know a little bit about the room for those that haven't done these before. There are microphones in each of the um, smart rooms. So these microphones are very sensitive and they pick up a lot of conversation. So please hold your comments until you're asked. Um, and for questions, wait until you're asked as well. Um, Starlene and Mike Spivey are here with me today and they're gonna take you through the purchasing procedures and requisition. I think it's going to be a fantastic session. If you're like me, I'm like so much I can learn from this. Um, and also, just to remind you that once we are done today, this video is being recorded and it will be available on the HR Blackboard site. You'll just need to click the professional development link and look for the 2013 professional development series. So, I'm going to hand it over to Starlink and thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Daisha. And I also would like to welcome those of you, uh, the ones that are here on the Lee campus and also on the other campuses. Uh, Mike and I both appreciate you being here uh, and taking part in this workshop. Today we're going to talk a little bit about the basic principles of public procurement and also the procurement process. And I may be giving more um, introductory um, examples today than actual how-to as far as purchasing goes, but I think sometimes that background is very helpful for those of you that are new to purchasing. Okay, um, exactly what does procure mean? In the dictionary, it tells us that it's to get possession of or obtain by particular care. But in public procurement, which is what we're doing with the community college system, it's the process that we use to acquire goods, services, equipment, or anything else that we need to purchase that will make our job easier and uh, enable the students to learn what they need to do. Also, there is a public procurement and there is a private procurement. And there is a huge, huge difference in these two things. We are considered public procurement. And we can only do what is authorized by law and the rules. And believe you me, we have lots and lots of those. Um, it also restricts the contact between us and our suppliers. And there are legal ramifications if these laws and rules are not followed. I know I went to a workshop not long ago and I was really shocked, um, you know, to hear that we can be held personally responsible for things that we do. Um, you know, even like signing our name to something if we do not have the authority to do that. So that's something all of us need to really remember. And as far as the private side, they can basically do whatever they want to that's not prohibited by law. And there's no restriction as far as their contact with the suppliers. Okay, um, just to touch a little bit on what a contract is. It's a binding agreement between two or more persons or parties and it's legally enforceable. To be enforceable, a contract requires certain things. There has to be an offer from a vendor for specific materials or services. There also has to be an acceptance by us of that offer. Then there has to be consideration given uh, by money for any value that we're given or um, that's received. Again, this points out the fact that if you're going to sign a contract, you have to have that authority to do that. And specifically, you can be held responsible on a contract like this. And one other note that I'd like to mention, the Community College Trustee Board has a policy in effect now that is being reworked. So um, just take everything I say in this respect with a grain of salt. 
because we are hoping to fine tune it. Any contract that comes across our desk that is for $10,000, whether it's for commodities, whether it's for services like uh, security or anything like that, it has to go before the trustee board. We have to have their approval of that. It also has to go to Jimmy Love. And I know we've seen a lot of contracts in the last few years that have been signed by people that really don't have the authority to sign them. Luckily, we haven't had any issues and you know, no one's been hauled off to jail yet. But uh, just be careful if you have something in the way of a contract that's $10,000 <coughs> up because it will have to have approval and be signed by the uh, chairman of the board of trustees. So why do we have public procurement? The state tells us that it's more efficient, it's more effective, we get better quality, better values, <coughs> and we also can have it comp competitively bid. There are also three principles of public procurement, and that's that we all need to be accountable for what we do, our actions with the vendors, uh, we need to follow the state guidelines and we need to use good business practices. So as far as being accountable, I always like to say that we all need to be honest, especially with the suppliers. You know, don't uh, pit one supplier against another one. Be honest with all of them. If you tell one of them you want ABC, <coughs> be sure you tell the other one you want ABC. You should not give uh, preferential treatment to any vendor. You have to treat them all with the same um, respect. And also, always be sure to um, seek competition. Our sources of authority for what we do are the North Carolina General Statutes, the North Carolina Administrative Code, and the Agency Purchasing Manual. At the very end of this, I've given you the website for all of those. The agency purchasing manual is on our internet, and I also have that at the end too. Um, we are undergoing some major, major changes in procurement because of things that are changing at the state level. We had changes on uh, July 1st by the state controller with assets. We had um, changes September 1st with the technology side, which is IT in Raleigh. And as we speak now, there are changes being made at person contract in Raleigh and people are probably losing their jobs today. So there's just a lot of changes in the purchasing world right now. So when you look at that agency purchasing manual, just remember that some of those things may be changing or may have already changed, it just haven't been updated yet. Also, when you're doing uh, purchasing, there are a couple things I want to mention to you. Um, always remember that we are spending taxpayers' money and that we need to always be mindful of that and try to get the best value at the best price, best quality that we can with someone else's money. Um, also, we need to avoid doing business with personal friends who have businesses or family members. And I'm not sure if any of you know this, it's not on like a slide up there or anything, but um, we are not allowed to do business with an employee of this college. Um, if Jessica had a printing business on the side, we could not hire her to do college printing and paper. That is absolutely against what we cannot do that. Okay, on the handout that I gave you, the very back sheet has a requisition. And I know this sounds like a very simple thing, but you'd be amazed at the way we get them in. Um, so, it's, and this is really very, very basic, but I, I mean, it is important to us because you would not believe the, the way some of them come in. But the two can be to Mike, to Debbie, or to me. And I thought, if anyone need a pen, I got some extra. Um, and of course your name there and the date. We get a lot of them in that have no date on them. Um, as far as the charge to on the right hand side, that would be your curriculum area, your department, 
if it's being paid by a grant, you need to write that up there. If it's being paid out of student um, IT funds, technology funds or whatever, any kind of information you can give us, because if you don't write it up there, then we don't know. To go along with that, the code number should match what you put under the charge to. The um, vendor and address, many vendors have lots and lots of locations. So if you've been talking with a sales rep from the Lolly area and you don't put an address in there, then we might send you to Greensboro or Atlanta or wherever. So be sure you put that address in there because that's important. Yes, ma'am. As far as um, the code number, uh -huh. is there a listing somewhere where we can find to codes for our departments or for things that we may need to purchase is there a is there something on the on the internet with that not that i'm aware of camera joiner is the sole person that can change or add codes and she keeps up with all of them we get ours from her and i know she does send them out maybe quarterly or maybe um, more often that if you ask for it, she'll give it to you but she will give you just the codes that pertain to you or to your area, but she's the one that will give them to you. So if we're unsure about what, to, how to code something, we just email Tamara and ask? Uh-huh, you can. Yeah. Or if your codes have been set up, sometimes we can help you, but to be on the safe side, probably ask her, because she is the one that has to, you know, take care of those. And the thing is, if you put the wrong code on there and we don't catch it, then she's gonna wind up having to do a journal entry to correct it. Gotcha. So it, it probably is better to ask her in the first place. Okay. And I think one thing they should, um, and everyone in here, to get from this session is better to call us and ask questions before you do it, mm -hmm. because we don't want you to waste your time, you know, doing it and it's wrong, and then you'll get upset because we give it back to yeah. you. So you know, just ask us in the beginning. We we don't mind at all. And thank you for asking the question. The rest of you, if you have any, let me know. Um, the sequence number, that causes people a lot of problems because they think that's the part number or the description number of the item. That merely is like numbering the items, one, two, three, four. That's all that is. And we couldn't put item because a lot of times you're, we have part or stop number down there. Sometimes it's called item number. So if we put item number, people tend to put the wrong thing in that column. So it's strictly just numbering your items. Obviously the quantity, you know what that is, and the description. And one thing I want to mention here, and you will not find this anywhere probably written down, but this has to do with the computer. There are only so many spaces in a field that we can add what an item is. So the most important thing you can put in that description is what it is. If it's a file cabinet, it's cabinet comma file. If it's well, I'm thinking of something else. I started to say pencil, but you couldn't call that anything else. But um, the main thing, the item, the name of the item, not the model number and all that kind of stuff, put what it is first. That is a big help. Um, uh -huh. How detailed do you want that description? Because when I've done things, I'll cut and paste right off the Tiger Direct. It would be 3.5 cable, blah, 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 this, this, this male connector, female box, so-and-so. Well, like three line thing. Do you need all that? Or do you just need audio case and then the stock number part? Of yeah, probably that's enough because we'll run out of space. And then too, it'll make, you know, it'll print out five pages for what could have been on one or two. So really, if you've got a good model number, the manufacturer, and you know, if you, a lot of times you'll have a manufacturer number too. But when it gets into all that big detail, no, we don't need all that. Okay, and then of course your unit price and always extend over to the total price. Now here again, if you order something, you need to make sure that you check to see if there's shipping because it has to be shown as an item on the requisition. Once we complete a purchase order, we can't go back and add anything. But if you put shipping in there, and if you don't even know, if they tell you, well, we don't know how much it is, you can just put $20. And then when it changes, if the invoice comes in and it's 25, we can change that 20 to 25, but if you don't put a line on there for shipping, then we can't do that. So it's better to put an estimated shipping on there always. And while we're on this page right here, before I go any farther with this one, um, 
I know that under $2,500 you're not required to have quotes on anything, but it really is a wonder, I'm gonna give you more on that in just a minute, but it is, it's a wonderful idea to come and if you pull a, a part on the website, David, like you're talking about, don't just take that as the price. Call them and ask for an educational price. Nine times out of 10, you'll get one and you'll get a discount. So, you know, I know it takes a little bit more time and it's not required, but that really is a great business practice to do. And it's like a school a lot of money. Okay, um, oh, I think we'll go to the next slide, Mike. And I told Mike to, if he thinks of anything, because he and Debbie key in a lot from almost all of these anymore, uh, once we get them turned into POs. So if you think of anything you want to add, um, just interrupt me. Okay, the room and building, it says that it's only required for equipment, but it certainly is helpful if you want to put that on there, if you happen to know what it is. It kind of goes along with the next one, the ship too, because you really need to put that on there too. And I know Kim, in your case, we've had a lot of things that maybe Melissa Fogarty or someone has ordered here, but they ship to Harney County. But if no one remembers to put that on there, then we don't know that it goes to Harney County. So if you're ordering something that goes to a different site, please be sure to put that on there. And you know, even with having that on there, there are so many vendors that even though we do that, they still ship it here instead of shipping it where it's supposed to go. So that's just something we have to live with. Also, um, if it's on a term contract, which we're gonna talk about again in a minute, or if you've gotten a quote, put your quote number on there. And then on the right hand side, you'll have your uh, signature, the requester, the department head, and then your deed. And I think, Daisha, I think I mentioned to you that we could accept uh, electronic signatures now. I think that was before you guys came in. You can use electronic signatures now. As of this past August, the compliance officer told me they will accept them. So you don't have to have original signature. And down at the very bottom of the requisition form, there's a um, address down here that really is extremely important. It tells you how to go on e-procurement to check to see if the vendor is registered with e-procurement. The community college system is mandated 100% for the only uh, division in the state that has to do them 100%. And I'm told that years ago, the guy who was president of the community college system decided that all community colleges would do that. So, We've, they've even had some bills introduced where presidents have tried to get that changed so we could go outside of that. But so far, it's never been changed. So if you order something, the vendor has to be on e-procurement, or if they're not on there, then we have to send them the information and try to get them to join. There is a 1.75% fee that is charged back to the vendor that you use on e-procurement. State bills that we don't bill that, but there is a 1.75% fee for doing business with the state of North Carolina. Any questions on filling this out? Okay. I have a question kind of more about the, and you may get to this, but the kind of before process. Well, kind of, so to, when you turn this in, that is before anything's been ordered or anything like that and basically a purchase order is created which is saying that once we get the item in the invoice then we would pay it that's what the purchase order is right and the state says you can't pay it before you get it mm -hmm. anybody else okay next slide And now we get to the nitty gritty. <laughs> okay, these are the things that changed July 1st this year for us. Um, general commodities. Under $2,500, as I said a while ago, no competition. 
but I urge you to seek competition to get a better deal if you possibly can. Anything more than 2,500, we have to do e-quotes. Mike does 99% of the e-quotes, but you have to send him the information to do it. And I'll get to that in just a few minutes as to what he needs. Um, anything 10,000 and up, we have to prepare the document and send it through the interactive purchasing system electronically to purchase and contract. They bid it out for us. At the present time, they receive the bids back. They evaluate them, or they don't evaluate them, we evaluate them. They send them to us, we evaluate them, and then we suggest who we'd like to go with. When we send it back to them, if they concur with what we've decided, then they give us permission to uh, place that order. Um, that one takes a while, probably four to six weeks to get that through the process. Okay, it's pretty much the same for technology items, except that the limit is 25,000. So up to 20, oh yeah, okay, I've got costs more than 25,000, we send to Raleigh, but from 2,500 up to the 25,000, we'll do e-quotes. <clears throat> That's the one that has changed September 1st instead of ITS sending out um, the bids for us, we have to now send them out. That we send them to ITS for their oversight, they make sure that what we have in the bid is okay, then we send it out and get the bids back, evaluate, choose who we want to award it to, and then send it back to them for their so it's kind of a, a tough thing now to process that when it takes a while. Okay, uh, sometimes you hear that you can't find this particular item anywhere else. That's what we call a sole source. And I might add here that there's a big emphasis at the state level now to do away with sole source because they say that people, there's so many people doing <coughs> the same thing that a sole source is not really legitimate anymore. We still try to use it if we possibly can. <clears throat> um, if you have a sole source, when you send your documentation in, your uh, requisition form, any other thing we ask for, you have to have documentation from that vendor on their letterhead <coughs> as to why theirs is a sole source that you can't find it anywhere else. Then you as the end user, and Kim's had some uh, experience with this, you have to submit written justification why you can only use this particular piece, why you can't use what the vendor down the street has, why it's not the same thing. I think I touched a little bit more on this too far along. <clears throat> Any questions, anybody? Okay, under uh, what we require for bids or equotes, they're both pretty much the same. We will need the completed requisition we just talked about. We would like to have a quote from a vendor that you've been working with that has what you want and how much you know they're gonna sell it to you for. We also need all the specifications. Uh, included in those specifications should be whether you need it installed, whether you need training on site or elsewhere, if you need training, do you need it for one person, three people, two hours, four days? You have to be specific about what you want. And basically, you can put in a specification just about anything that you want. Um, if you want warranty for three years hence, or you know whatever, but if you don't state it in there, then you can't get back and add it. Um, if this one, it happened not to be a sole source, and you know the other vendors, um, that might have what you want, then put those names and addresses and so forth down for us because that's very helpful. Again, the sole source letter, if it's applicable to your bid, your justification for the sole source. And the very bottom one is a new one. If you have, and this I think is a great example, but we have classrooms now with the smart technology in it. So anytime we you know, try to purchase more. We always use brand specific because we don't want this room to have smart and the room next door to have something else. We want it to be, you know, have continuity there. 
So brand specific, most of the time it's not difficult to get through the system. They will usually let you do that. Um, before you requisition equipment for something that's going to affect the utilities. I don't know if any of you, you guys either one had any issues with any of that. I don't think you haven't either, Kim. Um, I know I love to tell this example that Ronnie Beesema, he got us started trying to get this project approval for him because someone sent in a order for a refrigerator with an ice maker. Well, the refrigerator with the ice maker came in, he goes to install it, and when he gets there, there's no water there. So, you know, and that's just one example, but you get things like that all the time. We have some even in the new building in Harnett now that are supposed to be plugged into the wall, that's whatever they bought, there's no outlet there. So if you're gonna buy anything that requires any change whatsoever to utilities, you have to submit the project approval form first and get approval before you do that. As far as the uh, major equipment state guidelines, was this one changed July? This was another change, I think July 1st. Um, the state's definition of capitalized assets is it's either property, can be land, um, it can be works of art, all those things they have listed up there. The important part is that it has to be equal to or greater than $5,000. It also has to have a useful life of two or more years in order to qualify for $5,000. I've been here 25 plus years and it's been $1,000 as long as I can remember. And as of July 1st, it went to 5,000. So the things that are five now are the only ones that will have the barcode label that Tamara keeps up with and then she has to depreciate every year. Everything else has changed underneath the $5,000 amount. For those of you, I don't know if any of y'all been here long enough to know that we had something called minor equipment in years past, and that was anything that didn't meet that threshold of $1,000. Well now, anything that's under the $5,000, you still have to charge it to equipment, but we don't capitalize it and we don't depreciate it. In the past, even up until July or June 30th this past year, we could buy furniture, uh, small pieces of equipment out of small money, no more. Now, everything that's under the $5,000 range has to be paid from equipment money. And these assets are not consumable and they do have an extended useful life. And I think about Harnett Correctional because they buy a lot of saws, but now they're not being bought out of supplies, they have to be out of equipment money. And the state gives us X number of dollars in equipment. So that's really all we have to spend for equipment. But we can't charge it to supplies anymore. Um, Non-capitalized equipment is a non-consumable asset and should never be purchased with supply money. So I want to be sure to put that in there. <clears throat> that's a huge change. Okay, the other thing they came up with at the state level um, in the non-capitalized assets, there's one that's plain like we just went over. This one is called high-risk assets. The state <laughs> says data processing, networking, servers, computers, all that technology, even down to the, like the little two and three hundred dollar tablets and iPads and stuff we buy, they all now have to be tagged as high-risk asset because they easily take legs and walk off. That is a big job for all of us to have to keep up with all that. Um, and we're hoping we're going to have a new tag to put on it so people can keep up with it easier. And we can add to that too, you know, if we think of things um, that we'd like to add in there. That, you know, if any of you have any suggestions, if you buy something that you're afraid that someone may walk off with, you know, let us know and we can certainly tag it for you. <clears throat> All right, uh, we mentioned the uh, source for our authority, the North Carolina General Statutes, and I put something up there where you can find that. It's on your handout. And next one. 
these are just the ones we referred to earlier. But the administrative code, the general statutes are two things that we have to follow all the time. And if you can't sleep one night, you might want to look at them. It's kind of, it's very difficult. <laughs> There's a lots and lots and lots of them. Um, okay, we'll get the next one. Person contract, the term contracts. Um, if you go to that website, the PNC website right there, and click on that term contract, and since you're not gonna know the term, co term contract number or even if there is one, if you put in a word, again, like file cabinet, um, it'll pull up the contract if there is one listed in there. As far as term contracts, the university system uses those, the community college system uses them, state agencies use them, public schools are exempt, so, and local governments. But we do have the authority to use that term contract, or we also have something called a flexibility law, where if we can find something that's extremely similar to what's on the term contract and cheaper, then we can go off that contract and buy under the flexibility law. And I know this is a lot of stuff to throw at you guys. You're probably not going to remember a lot of it. Um, and that's why I made this really basic, because I was hoping that maybe you'd ask questions, because it's really difficult to tell you everything that we have to consider when we do purchase things. Um, and of course, e-procurement, I told you how to search that for the registered vendors. And then I think the last slide, Mike, shows um, what's on the intranet. All of you familiar with supply store? Okay. And that the requisition and the catalog are both on there. Um, okay. So when you said supply store, that had a, brought a question to my mind. I went in there recently and I was just asking for a calendar, like a simple wall mm -hmm. calendar. Um, not the desk calendar, but just something to stick on the wall. The foundation had provided me with one for 2013, mm -hmm. but I was hoping to get a new one. And um, talked to Jimmy, and Jimmy said, well, we don't have those, but we do have the desk calendars, like the long ones and then the little ones that, you know, you can stick into something. Um, but things like that that may not be at the supply store, but I would like to have one. I mean, I know I can go out and purchase one on my own. requisition it. So I just would go buy one and then requisition. No, you don't buy it. You, you actually just, we have a FSI, which is forms of supply. Um, they have, we have a catalog of theirs and they have a, there's a term contract 615, right? That's term contract 615. You know, and I, I think we've talked on there how you can put in, alpha, you could just put the word calendar in there uh -huh. and it would pull up forms of supply. But you order it through them, but see, we get tremendous discounts from these people that are on term contracts. And FSA, you have their um, website Forms listed. and supply. Well, if you write, well, Mike has, she can't go on the website, they'll get the pricing just you, right? Right. Yeah, he has a password to get into the pricing, but you can look at the catalog. He's got a catalog. Kimberly you might, may not like for me to say this, but you can shop as a guest on there just to see what they have. Okay. And then I email Mike and ask him what the price is. Well, or even when yeah. you shop on there as a guest, just fill out your requisition. And when he gets it, he's going to automatically check it anyway. Yeah, so I just print that, that budget. Yeah, you could do that. What is that website? If you just, um, do, I think it's just forms and supply. Shopfsi.com. Shopfsi.com. And you just go in as a guest and Got you it. can search it. And then you'll so, was it about 30 or 40 percent? 30, 50 percent. Oh, Whatever well. price is listed, our price will be 30 to 50 percent 50 less than that. Too. So it's a lot cheaper that way. So then I would, once I have a calendar that I like, I would fill out the requisition form, send it in to Mike. I'll order it. You yeah. would, but I still have to get all those approvals, even for yes. like mm -hmm. a calendar. Right. That may be too <laughs> and large. everything yep. you buy needs to be on a purchase order. Purchase order. Uh, requisition. 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 And then a well, with the purchase okay. order, yeah. Just the process we just talked about. Okay. Yeah. Fill out this requisition form and then send it in. Now, calendars we don't have in the catalog because we only need to buy them once a year when they change. You know, it's not like paper clips or something you use every day. So that's why they're not in the catalog. I don't think they're in there. Um, cartridges for your printer. 
Mm -hmm. In the catalog, there are certain model numbers that Jimmy keeps in stock in the supply mm -hmm. store. If your printer doesn't use one of those, you got to go this route. And they don't have to put a vendor on there, do they? Because you have somebody you use for the cartridge, or do they need to put one? I would go ahead and put a vendor, but then I'm, I may not necessarily order it from whatever vendor you put on the requisition. Right. If I know somebody else has got a better deal. So. But if Mike has the cartridge out in the supply store, you can just, you know, go get it and fill out the little half requisition sheet. But if, you, if it, yours uses a different one, then you got to go this route. Okay. What happens if, say, I went out and purchased something online and I've already bought it? <laughs> if you look in the purchasing manual, it probably says in all capital letters, if you do, you may be paying for it yourself. Okay. And I don't mean that ugly, but that's kind of a standing joke with us. But over the years, I've been here maybe four times in 25 plus years, they have refused to reimburse people about four times. That's all. So if you do that, then you do the reimbursement for? Um, that, well, you do the check request to check. reimburse you, yeah. Okay. But see, everything is supposed to be on a PA. That's the way we're supposed to do everything. See, because the college is paying for it, purchase order is the college's contract, contract with the supplier that we will pay mm -hmm. for whatever item you want. If you don't do if we don't do the purchase order up front, then really the college is not obligated to pay for mm -hmm. to reimburse you or pay for something that you have bought without the college's approval through the purchase order. And in terms of I know four questions, in terms of training, so say that like we recently did data tell training, which is our um, applicant tracking process. We just had a webinar where a gentleman came on and mm -hmm. took us through that training. I was not the one that actually requested the training or paid for it, but I had asked the question of, how are we going about getting that paid? So if there is an issue where we're needing another training session with this data tail provider, we would fill out the requisition and then get an estimate for because he bills by the hour so if we went over that's still okay yeah we can adjust it okay right. and you could even write estimate on here uh -huh. and if you get a quote from them that you know shows how much is per hour just attach it to this okay. but just if you just write a note on there and say you know this may change if you know if they go over or something we've got to fail okay but yeah everything really should be on our requisition and then a PO. So after I fill out the requisition, the, the PO, is that the check request? Is that, is that's totally thing? different. Mm -hmm. Check request is filled out when there is no PO, and it goes direct to Creed Smith in the okay. business office. It doesn't come to us. But we really shouldn't, that's not a preferred way of doing things. Right. You know, because Dr. Price has to sign off on every single one of those things. Okay. Did you have a question, Victor? Okay. Him, anybody else? Kimberly, you've done a lot of requisitions. You can probably tell them a lot of things you've So, learned. Kimberly, you'll be my She really has, and she, she is extremely good at it. Except for I didn't know that the sequence was just now I'm going to. I always put the part number in. Yeah, well, I didn't know that, or I probably wouldn't have said it that way. But you do such a great no, job. No, there otherwise. you go. Now I know. So yeah, cool. that's right. Um, Deja, I just ask them. Like, if I don't know, I just go and ask because I'd rather try to do it. Right. How they want me to, then having to redo it. Mm -hmm. so, and they're really good about helping me. <laughs> One other thing I'll mention to you, and I don't know if any of you would have a reason to do this, um, but in years past, they have let some people buy gift cards, gas cards, things along that line. And we have been told we absolutely cannot do that because of the internal revenue mm -hmm. issue that it involves that. So we do not buy gift cards. You know, sometimes they want to do them uh, to give to somebody, maybe in Connie, I'm just picking on me because that came to my mind, not necessarily that they do it, but um, to give to someone that's voting something, another, some instructor or something, but you cannot do that. And where is the PO found? Where is that for? Well, we create it. Oh, what, okay, yeah, so that's what, not something yeah. that I feel like. Yeah, uh -huh. oh. yeah, you fill out the requisition form and then the person in the department turns it into a PO. Gotcha. And it, it, there are like four cop original three copies, and one of those copies will come back to you Okay. Uh, as the end user. Got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm.
Any other questions, Kim? You've been ordering a ton of stuff. You could probably give them a lot of instructions too. Well, I don't know about that. I seem to mess up something every time. <laughs> Anything else? Well, I would like to say once more that anytime you have a question, don't hesitate to call us or come by. I mean, I sincerely mean that. And I know Mike and Debbie would be glad to help you out too. And even if you have trouble getting to the uh, term contracts, Several people have been by and they'll just sit down in Debbie's office and show, show them how to get to the term contracts because Mike and Debbie do that all the time. And so they are very, very good at it. And Mike's been around a few years too, so. <laughs> uh, do you want to tell them too about the number of items on a requisition? Look, I'll get into that some. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, are the accounting department prefers that we not put more than 15 line items on a requisition slash purchase order the reason being because if you get more than 15 line items it slows data tail down to where it's just a really laborious process to get through the purchase order or voucher process whatever you're working with in data tail so and even if you if you i mean we're not saying that you can't order 30 items but we we will have to split it into two different purchase orders possibly if you send it to us and, and four pages of a requisition with 30 items so if you can possibly keep your requisitions to 15 line items or less even if you have to submit multiple requisitions then that's the way we have to do it because especially for the end users in any procurement um, which I don't believe anybody in here is but you know if they go ahead and enter the requisition in the procurement with 30 line items that we have to backtrack and split it into two orders and it's you have to copy the orders and resubmit them any procurement all different things like that so if you can keep your requisitions to 15 line items or less that helps the entire process and then you also have to keep in mind you can't split an order between to to avoid the $2,500 benchmark you can't just do two different requisitions um, because what we're going to do is it, even in the, the auditors look at like usually a two week to a month period of vouchers to a particular vendor they're going to look at the entire amount that's vouchered to that we pay a vendor so you know we can't enter several different purchase orders with each one being less than $2,500 to get around the $2,500 requirement for competitive bids so you know sometimes people will enter send us requisitions for that will maybe Three different requisitions in the same day that will total more than twenty five hundred dollars and we'll have we may have to contact you and say you know we can't order all this at one time we need to spread the business among other vendors which is kind of the whole process that we want to do is to give all different vendors business and so that's kind of what's about the whole idea behind it also but just keep in mind and i know that a lot of times it seems like one rule goes against another rule <laughs> but but we'll let you know if you break one of the rules <laughs> well I, I can't think of it right this minute but um, I know today was kind of introductory to what purchasing is all about and also just very basic information. Um, and they should, it may be that somewhere down the road, these people that have listened to this today, maybe we could go to the next level. Yes. Because there's lots and lots of other things that pertain, but when you hear so much, it's just, yeah. you know, you're just overwhelmed. Absolutely. But we stay overwhelmed. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. <laughs> But anyway, we're here to help you, so thank you for coming today, and if there's anything that we can do for you, we're happy to do so.
Thank you, guys. Yeah, great great job. Thank you.